Uh, the religion of phallus worship, which Lawrence promotes to save women from emancipation, is important in the work of Sigmund Freud too, and Millet goes into some detail on the work of Sigmund Freud, which we'll look at later. Now, um, Millet looks next at the work of Henry Miller, who was also very fond of the C word and the F word. In Sexus, in the book Sexus, um, he was obviously doing what's called by his publishers breaking down sexual barriers. Um, and these sexual barriers are broken down through the explicit description of the sexual degradation of a woman. And in this novel, in the bits that Millet quotes at the beginning of the novel, the hero grabbed his hostess as she brought, bought, brought him towels for his bath. It happened so quickly that she didn't have time to rebel or even pretend to rebel. In other words, this is sexual assault. That's a, another word for it, of course. Um, he swiftly had her in the tub, stockings and all. Uh, and he, this is the way that Ida's behavior is described. She was just like a bitch in heat, biting me all over, panting, gasping, wriggling like a worm on the hook. As a finale, uh, he made her stand up, bend over, then I let her have it from the rear. The script is quite straightforwardly pornographic, and he wrote loads of these books. Uh, the woman is not really human, and she's manipulated for the man's excitement. Um, Miller writes, She had a small, juicy cunt, which fitted me like a glove. And for a finale, the, the hero sadistically assaults her. Um, I bit, uh, he says, I bit the nape of her neck, the lobes of her ears, the sensitive spot on her shoulder. And as I pulled away, I left the mark of my teeth on her beautiful white ass, not a word spoken. And this is because she's not really a fully human person who's in any kind of relationship of equality with him. Now, um, and Millet dissects the text very expertly, and she shows the, the cruelty that it contained, behavior which I think would elsewhere be called sexual assault. The woman is treated as a servant, and she's grabbed, she's forced into sexual use, but she's immediately avid for the abuse. And that is, of course, the timeless motif of pornography. The women are assaulted, but they love it, or they love it very quickly after the first minute. So in this period, there was not much public pornography around, but these books served as it for the left intelligentsia of that period. This was their pornography. This is what they were reading and expecting the women who were having relationships with them to also read at that time if they were sexually free and sexual liberals. Now, Millet explains that the action is directed at a male reader, and it's intended to cause him excitement from the exercise of masculine power. He gains, she says, a, a nearly supernatural sense of power. And she says that the, this description is a case of sexual politics at the fundamental level of copulation. And as Millet points out, Miller's attitudes towards women, his hatred and contempt, are revealed very clearly in the way that women are described in the novels. Women are usually presented as non-human animals in the novels that are disgusting. He's horrified by women who show a sexual response in particular, and if they show a sexual response, they are described as disgusting non-human animals. He says, uh, the dirty bitches, they like it, and... Uh, Millet says, clinical, fastidious, horrified, and amused to record how one responded squealing like a pig, another like a crazed animal, one gibbered, another crouched on all fours like a she-animal, quivering and whinnying, while still another specimen was so deep in heat she was like a bright, voracious animal, an elephant walking the ball. He explained, Miller, um, Miller explains elsewhere, that he used sexual intercourse in order to relieve tensions. And these, this is his language, his words. During intercourse, they, that is tensions, 
cast out of me as though I were empty, emptying refuse in a sewer. <sighs> um, yeah, these were the sexual revolutionaries, the heroes of their time. These days, for that sort of language, but you might be able to tell me this in discussion, but I suspect that you would need to go to what's actually called pornography now rather than high literature, but I'm not sure about that. They may be supposedly high literature that still has those sort of sentiments in it, and I just I don't actually read any literature by men at the present moment and haven't for many years, so I wouldn't know. But please do tell me. I mean, once you've had enough of this stuff, you think, I can't, can't be bothered. You know? Why would I carry on with this? Um, Millet explains that Miller gave voice to certain sentiments that masculine culture had long experienced, but always rather carefully suppressed. And these were the yearning to effect a complete depersonalization of woman into cunt. Now, this level of misogyny is evident in the work of the other sex novelists that she analyzes here. Um, she has a, a quote at the beginning of the book from Norman Mailer's The American Dream. Apparently Norman Mailer is somebody who, who moved from being a darling of the left to a darling of the right. So he, he made a journey, but at this time he's darling of the left. Um, he's, the American Dream is about a college professor who has just murdered his wife and he's sexually abusing his German maid at the time of this quote. Now, he decides to bugger the, the maid against her will because he finds the smell of her anus particularly fascinating. And she's described in this piece as a, a kind of sewer rat. Um, and this, these are his words here. A thin, high, constipated smell, a smell which spoke of rocks and grease and the sewer damp of wet stones in poor European alleys came needling its way out of her. She was hungry like a lean rat she was hungry. And it could have spoiled my pleasure, except that there was something intoxicating in the sheer narrow pitch of the smell, so strong, so stubborn, so private. It was a smell which could be mellowed only by the gift of furs and gems. So he's trying to construct an idea of her. Also in the book it says that because she was German and this is post-war, it was quite reasonable to treat her in this way because she represented Nazism, so that was okay. Now... Um, anal penetration is an important method, as I say in all of these novels, of teaching lessons to women and establishing men's power in these novels, as it is in the pornography industry today. If you have any interest in pornography today, hopefully not, but if you go onto pornography websites, you will see that a very large proportion of it is about anal sex, often double anal, often um, anal rape by large groups of men and so on. So anal penetration is absolutely central to pornography today. And what I'm wanting to say here today is that this is not new. If we understand what was going on in these novels by these left intelligentsia in the 60s, we can see all of those values now in the pornography of today. Now, um, Kate Millett then goes on, um, well, she has in the center of the book, a section which she calls Notes Towards a Theory of Patriarchy where she sets up what she sees as the cultural and political context which allows these novels to be written in the way that they are. Um, she describes this central section of sexual politics as a sketch, which might be described as notes towards a theory of patriarchy. It will, she says, attempt to prove that, that sex is a status category with political implications. In the first part of the sketch, she describes the great challenges to patriarchy that were created by the women's movement of the 19th century up to 1930. And she looks at the work of John Stuart Mill and John Ruskin, Marx and Engels and Oscar Wilde and so on. In the second section from 1930, she looks at what she describes as the reaction or counter-revolution against the advances that have been made in women's status. And here she looks at the reactionary models for womanhood of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. She looks at what she calls the reaction in ideology that came from male intellectuals and academics as they thought, sought to justify women's inferior status and attack feminism. And of course, her first and major target is Sigmund Freud. 
And she goes on also, of course, to uh, criticize post-Freudians, as she calls them, such as the popularizer of Freud, Marie Bonaparte, the evolutionary psychologist, Lionel Tiger. Lionel Tiger's um, one of my um, favorites, evolutionary <coughs> psychologist. And his book was called Men in Groups. And he talks about you know, men's behavior coming from animals and so on. It's so lovely that he's called Lionel Tiger. And his name's actually one of these rather manly animals, so that's lucky for him. You know? <laughs> If he was Lionel Spider, it might have been harder to, to have the academic reputation that he has. And, and functionalists, um, functionalist sociologists such, such as Talk at Parth, uh, Parsons, she um, has a go at as well. Now, she says such people created what she calls the vast grey stockades of the sexual reaction. She identified Freudianism as one of the most important forces in the creation of the permissive cultural context in which the woman-hating of the cultural agents could be displayed and understood as progressive. Now, well, I'll just say something here about what Millet has to say about Freud. I think her analysis of Freud is probably the best um, in feminist literature. It's the strongest and clearest. But she is in a long tradition of feminist theorists who have pointed out the importance of Freud's work in creating an anti-woman ideology. The first was Viola Klein, who is not much known today. Um, she wrote two PhD theses, one in Freud, uh, uh, pardon me, one in um, uh, literature in Prague before she had to leave before the Second World War. She had to leave in 1938, um, and her parents perished. And um, when she got to London, she did another thesis, and this became the book that was published in 1946 called The Feminine Character. And in there she looks at Freud, she looks at Havelock Ellis, the sexologist, and she does wonderful analyses of their anti-woman ideologies. Uh, Klein was excluded from the Masculine Academy, and she only achieved an academic job at the University of Reading in sociology in 1964, nine years before her death at the age of 65. So she's yet another one of these women who did write very remarkable work, but was not um, recognized for it. Uh, of course, then Simone de Beauvoir also took on Freud's work with considerable authority in The Second Sex in 1949. She does a good job. In 1970, the same year as Millet's work was published, Freud's ideology on woman was analysed by a British feminist, Eva Feiges, in her book, The Patriarchal Attitudes. Now, what was astonishing was that in 1974, Freud was rehabilitated by a famous socialist feminist of that time called Juliet Mitchell. It was a huge shock to feminists that she did this. Nobody could understand what was going on because the whole history of feminism had been saying Freud was crucial to, to the fight against women. Crucial, fundamental. And then she goes and writes this book in which she re re tries to rehabilitate him and said he's very useful really for feminism, the book Psychoanalysis on Feminism. Um, and she says that actually what was happening was that Freud um, was, when he was talking about penis envy and so on, it was all just symbolic really. He didn't actually mean it. That's not you know, he didn't mean the words as they appear on the paper. And that's often said about male scholars when women are trying to rehabilitate them and say something nice about them. Is they, you know, don't be so crude as to imagine they meant the actual words on the page. They meant something much different. And now I can use them and quote them and actually get a position in the academy because I'm quoting men and that's okay because I've made them okay. Right? Um, and that's very important because if you quote people like Kate Millett and Viola Klein, you are not going to get anywhere, usually. Now, um, Millet is, um, I, I, well, I should just say that Freud is now a sort of psychoanalytic, feminism is supposed to be a sort of aspect of postmodern feminism or whatever. The, it's still going on, all this rehabilitation. It's still out there. Um, if we want to talk about Freud later, I'm very happy in more detail. But Millet offers no excuses for the anti-woman ideology of Freud. She doesn't try to say he really meant something else. Um, she takes Freud at his word. And she classifies him as one of the number of new prophets that arrived on the scene between 1930 and 60 in reaction against the upheavals of the first wave of feminism before and after the First World War. And these prophets, she says, worked to clothe the old doctrine of the separate spheres, that is, for men and women, in the fashionable language of science. 
Freud argued that women should fulfill their biological destiny and not go out to work, of course, and he said that the urge to move into the professions and the public world stemmed from penis envy, and if you wanted to go into the professions, you had a masculinity complex, and so on and so on. Um, in, I thought we should have a little bit of description from Freud, just famous bits that you know already know very well. Um, he said that you know, girls were shocked by their first sight of a penis when they were young. This is, the, this, this is what he says. And you may be thinking, is that really so? They noticed the penis of a brother or a playmate, strikingly visible and of large proportions. At once... Rec <laughs> it's, it's symbolic. <laughs> At once recognize it as the superior counterpart of their own small and inconspicuous organ and from that time forward fall a prey to envy for the penis. Now, this has always puzzled me because there must be some little girls who never even see a penis at that time, not until they're perhaps grown up, and therefore how are they going to get all the complexes they're supposed to have, you know? <laughs> but apparently they've got to see one. It should be about seven years old, and um, I don't know what happens if they miss it. Um, as I now, as a result of seeing it, uh, they realize they suffer from a serious lack in not having such an organ, and they live their whole life in envy of it. Um, they can only be comforted for their loss by the birth of a baby as a substitute, preferably a boy baby, who would carry the, and Freud says, longed-for penis with him. Right? So they're able to give birth to a penis, and then they've got a penis, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Now, um, Millet says that Freud constructed a psychology of women as passive, masochistic, and narcissistic based upon this lack of the penis. But she sensibly asks why the little girl should consider the penis a superior organ at all, let alone be in awe of it. She asks why the girl does not, quote, imagine the penis is an excrescence and take her own body as norm. Now, that seems perfectly reasonable to me. Why doesn't the little girl go, ugh? You've got bits of your insides hanging on your outsides, right? <laughs> and why doesn't she do that? But apparently she doesn't. She's in awe. Now, um, as, as Millet points out, uh, Freud de deliberately and determinedly bypasses the straight, more straightforward explanations of women's psychological woes that he looks at, which are that they live under patriarchy, that they're undermined from the moment of their birth and taught an inferior status and then not allowed to fulfill their potential, and all of those things which can well account for the sort of problems in women that he was dealing with, perhaps more easily than the penis, which they may indeed never have seen, it seems to me. Now, I think that my favourite quote from um, my favourite witticism of Freud's, which actually she doesn't mention. I used to teach Freud, so I have sort of pages and pages of his witticisms. And the one I like best is the explanation as to why women knit. And the explanation as to why women knit is they need to knit thicker pubic hair to hide their lack. No, seriously? Seriously? But, of course, it's all symbolic, and therefore we don't need to worry about it. But, but what interests me is that these days we've got men taking up knitting. There's quite a few young men taking up knitting. And they do not have a lack, or they may do, but probably not. So I think defeated this idea, defeated, right? And roll on more male knitters, I say. Now, um, Reading sexual politics, it seems very clear that the woman-hating ideas Millet analyzes in the books of the 60s male novelists are now the stock in trade of the burgeoning pornography industry. When Millet wrote the book, pornography was still an underground industry, which the male leaders of the counterculture and the sexual revolution were struggling to de-repress. And the de-repression that they achieved getting rid of censorship laws in the 60s was crucial to the development of the pornography industry. They created that foundation with this work in the 60s. Um, the Millet's comment on the woman-hating sex novels of that time in the 60s is very apt, I think, to express the effect of the subsequent unleashing of the pornography industry. In relation to Henry Miller, she wrote, to provide unlimited scope for masculine aggression although it may finally bring the situation out into the open, will hardly solve the dilemma of our sexual politics. 
Now that unlimited scope for masculine aggression, I suggest, is exactly what the pornography industry is today, and that's very clear in its scale and scope and content. So that's what we now have as a massively um, profitable industry. When she was writing, though, um, the VCR had not been invented. Deep Throat, the movie, was not released until 1973. I think you're probably aware of what happens in that movie. Linda Lovelace Marciano, a woman with clear bruises upon her body from the handiwork of her violent pimp husband who always had a gun with him on the sets, swallows a penis whole on the premise that her clitoris was in her throat. Now, this was seen as the movie that democratized porn. And in fact, you will see today, and I have seen in girls' magazines for teenage girls, instructions on to how, how to swallow the penis whole. This is magazines aimed at girls who are about 14 years old. So, you know, this, this pornographic revolution has been enormously effective in constructing sexual ideas and constructing how sex is supposed to happen. But back then, in the 1960s and in 1970, porn was still understood as the preserve of socially inadequate men in raincoats who frequented dirty movie theatres. There, there were no videos at that time. But the ideas that Kate Millett looks at in these novels, I would suggest, are the lentils and potatoes, remember I'm a vegetarian, the lentils and potatoes of the hugely profitable contemporary global pornography industry, which is so normalised now that it's creating big changes in the ways that children relate to each other, viz the craze for sexting, where children are sending off to each other in schools photographs of their own genitals, to uh, their extreme harm in years to come, because the photographs of these girls' genitals can be put on the internet at any time, and they're unlikely to get the job in the law firm they might have wanted. But at 14, none of this is understood. The values of pornography are unchanged from those analyses. Now, let's just have a think about the size and worth of the pornography industry in the present and the extent to which it's been mainstreamed into the day-to-day -day business of major corporations, entertainment, fashion, music industries, and so on. Uh, the industry is now covered seriously in the business pages of newspapers. Pornography companies, such as Beata Uza from Germany, are listed on the stock exchange. The big mainstream pornography distribution companies have considerable incomes. Playboy earned, or at least it's said that it earned, because there may be more that they are hiding, 331,100,000 US dollars in 2006. Beata Uza from Germany earned 271 million US dollars. Now, the sexual ideology of the industry is identical to that of the revolutionary left intelligentsia of the 60s, the obsession with anal sex, with scatological language, with women as prostitutes, desperate to receive violent punishment from men. Um, and I thought I'd just read you a review of one porn uh, movie, fairly representative porn movie, from the website of Adult Video News, which is the online magazine of the US porn industry. And they review new movies every month, and, and they tell you what's in them and what is good about them. They're for the distributors and the sellers. Uh, in this particular movie, and let's compare it with the novels we've been thinking about. In this particular movie, a woman has two or three penises at one time shoved into her mouth, her vagina and anus, and is at times subjected to two penises in her anus. And it's described in the review thus. Cock-crazed Audrey is lighting up the room to critical mass levels with her blinding nuclear strength energy taking multiple man hammers. Two and three at a time in her mouth, cunt and arse for the better part of a very sweaty hour. Goddamn, fill me up like a fucking fuck whore, she roars to one and all. You see, you've got to have the cunt word in there, you've got to have the fuck word in there. The depraved blast furnace heat making her heavy makeup run down her pretty face all Alice Cooper-like. Audrey even sets a supposed new porn record such records being dubious at best, for length of time doing continuous double anus. That's two penises in the anus. 18 minutes, breaking, she tells me, Melissa Lauren's old 17-minute mark. Now, in fact, the movie may be an hour, but it will probably take about 12 hours to make. And, of course, the woman is having to take um, painkillers. Um, she'll have had to have an en enema beforehand. She will have various drugs to dissociate from what is going on and so on and so on, because that is how pornography has made, is made. Now, Millet argues in sexual politics 
that the woman-hating sex rants of the 60s were a response to the changing relationship between the sexes. And following that logic, we would have to understand the extraordinary vigor of the pornography industry today as a response to the considerable advances that women have now made. Um, in, it's not simply the pornography industry today that is actually um, encompassing these values. There is still a powerful industry of sexology and sex therapy which pr is promoting these sorts of anti-woman values in sex and they're very, very influential within Australian culture at the moment. I thought, since we are pretty much at the end, I might mention to you somebody who's been seen as very positive by an a Australian editorial, which is Bettina Arndt, in her book, The Sex Diaries. Now, um, Bettina Arndt was Australian editor of that important propaganda tool of the sexual revolution for a magazine in Australia from 1973. So she's from this time period. That's where she got her ideas. She is now promoting these ideas in a book in 2009. Aunt tells women, women are the problem apparently, uh, she says that she did got people to, to keep these diaries and found that men had a terribly hard time of it. They didn't get enough sex. Women sort of kept turning off the tap and not allowing them access, not allowing them to paddle their canoes, I think was one of the extraordinary images in there. And the men became very, very, very unhappy. And the women have to keep those men happy. So she says women have to just do it. Those are her words, like the Nike slogan. Just do it. Uh, they need to allow their male partners to penetrate them, despite their extreme reluctance and, in some cases, repugnance. You should read the descriptions of the unwanted sex in that book by women that she totally discounts. She, they talk about slime dripping down their legs. They talk about the pain. It's horrendous, the descriptions of how much they hate the unwanted sex. But she says they have to do it. They have to do it. Um, and she says, for the sake of their men, they need to reconfigure their minds. It's fascinating. The women talk about reconfiguring their minds, which is very similar to what prostituted women have to do, making a separation between mind and body so that they're able to suffer the violation. She tells ordinary married women that they need to reconfigure their minds um, and overcome the pain and discomfort of unwanted sex. If they reconfigure their minds and they're somewhere else, I guess, it will be possible for it to happen. So these, uh, the, the book has been, you know, it was published by Melbourne University Press. It's obviously an important book. Um, and has, there has been great acclaim for this book, which represents these rather unfortunate values. Now, uh, Kate believed that the feminist movement that was burgeoning when the book was published in 1970 would sweep away this kind of misogyny. In fact, the opposite has taken place. The misogynists won. And a massive global industry of pornography examined, embodying precisely the sexual ideology these men promoted is now worth billions of dollars for corporations and for organized crime. In the postscript to her book, Millett comments on the feminist movement that's growing in the US at that time. Encouraged by its strength and vigor, she comments as the very last line of her book, it may be that we shall even be able to retire sex from the harsh realities of politics but not until we have created a world that we can bear out of the desert we inhabit. Which I think is a very nice sentiment for right now because we have not created that world and I think the situation is in many ways in relation to the construction of sexuality enormously more critical than when this book was written. And I'll leave it there for now. Thank you.